We're a month out from the MLB draft, and there's been some interesting developments with this draft class. Let's talk about it. You are Locked On MLB Prospects, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Yes, welcome on in to Locked on MLB Prospects, your home for all things minor league baseball. I'm your host, Lindsey Crosby, baseball writer for Sports Illustrated. Thank you for making this your first listen every single day. And today's episode is brought to you by Blue Nile. Make your moment sparkle with jewelry from BlueNile.com. Locked on MLB listeners get $50 off a purchase of $500 or more. This podcast exclusive includes engagement. Use code Locked On at checkout at BlueNile.com. So, Again, month out from the draft, a some significant changes happened over the weekend as far as the draft pool, updated guys moving up and down the boards. I'm going to start off with the prep ranks. We've talked about prep pitching uh, and how that's the riskiest demographic. And this happens every year, but we now have the first prep player who has informed teams that he is not intending to be selected he intends to make it to a college campus so Indiana righty Andrew Dukanyic uh, he's depending on where you look he's anywhere between 35 and 40 on boards as of now the expectation was he was going to get downgraded a little bit uh, just based off some some less than stellar starts in the spring But he emailed teams on Sunday morning to let them know that he intends to attend Vanderbilt in the fall. Uh, Now, he's one of those based on age. In two years, he will be uh, a draft-eligible sophomore. So the 2024 class, something where if 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 you're 21 by the draft, even if you have not finished three years of college, you can still be drafted. Um, He will be 21 by the draft. So... There's a couple other guys that have done this. Um, but, like, Dukin is just, it, he's the first one to do it, the first notable guy. And it's really interesting that uh, he's going to Vanderbilt. So, obviously, baseball powerhouse, legend kind of there. Um, he's the first higher rated guy to do it. There's been some lower guys. Uh, Pennsylvania lefty Andrew Healy. He's like number, he's like round 375 to 400 on boards. He had already said he was withdrawing from the draft. He's going to Duke. And he's a, he's a big like 6'6". Lefty has a good feel for three pitches. And I think is going to be a pretty, pretty interesting prospect uh, when he does get drafted in three years. But uh, Dukanius was one of those guys... He looked at different times through the last summer and then the spring that he was going to be, uh, he possibly had multiple plus to like to double plus pitches. It looked to be one of the better pitchers in the draft. Again, had a little bit of command and control issues in the spring, and that's why he was going to get downgraded a bit. And the thought process was he was probably worth a second round pick, but somebody would take him in the first because of the potential behind those three pitches. He's committed to Vanderbilt, and it's something, obviously not all of these guys are going to make it to Vanderbilt, but there's a bunch of players who are committed, including uh, Noah Schultz. Noah Schultz is a uh, Aurora, Illinois lefty who is also committed to Vandy. He uh, he's expe- he, I think he's 6'8", um, fastballs in the low 90s, Really sharp slider, can throw a lot of strikes. He's a guy that is expected as well, based on salary demands, he's expected to officially announce he's going to college as well. He intends to make it to Vandy. And the thing about this Vanderbilt class, if all of... They won't. If all of these players made it to Vanderbilt, this would probably be one of the best draft classes, or best recruiting classes you've ever seen. So 11 top 500 players are committed to Vanderbilt, including seven top 100 guys. Outfielder Drew Jones, the number one overall um, recruit. Uh, Dylan Lesko, the righty. 
Uh, Brandon Barrera, the lefty, we talked about him last week. Andrew Dukaniich, like we said, Noah Schultz. Uh, third baseman, Sal Stewart. Outfielder, Ryan Clifford. I mean, huge, huge class. And so the thing here, and this is where I'm really interested to see what happens. So for those of you who don't follow college that much, and I know you're out there because I've seen the College Baseball Tuesday um, numbers of the show compared to the rest of the week. That's why we don't do a College Baseball Tuesday anymore, friends. Uh, But um, name, image, and likeness is now a thing in college. So as of last summer, July 1st, you are able as a college athlete to get paid money based off of uh, being a college athlete. So whether you endorse a product, whether you create your own custom merchandise, or the big thing now and what it's become, what it's majority become now, is most schools have what they call an NIL collective. And the collective will go and raise money from donors, whether it's individuals who are making small dollar donations, whether it's boosters who are doing large dollar amounts. But they will raise money with the intention of providing monthly cash payments to multiple players on the rosters. Uh, And obviously the sport that everybody first thought about when this came out was football. And then right after that, basketball. Because how marketable is a Division I starting quarterback, right? You know, a star wide receiver, a pass rusher, like... How marketable are those guys? You'd think about they'd be able to do endorsement deals and things like that. But what NIL has become is the collective has been paying multiple players, if not every player on the roster. We've seen some schools that every single player is receiving cash payments. And I think the big place where this can have an impact when it comes to the draft is going to be your draft-eligible juniors or this time, the seniors that have a COVID year. Because if a team tries to lowball, which I don't know why you would lowball, bonus-wise, a junior who can go back, but if a team tries to lowball a prospect, or a prospect doesn't get drafted nearly as high as they think they will, and the bonus is one of those, like we've talked about, when you see like an 18th round guy and it's like, yeah, he's got a $3,000 signing bonus. Some of these players, depending on the school they go to in the collective, because baseball only has 11.7 scholarships for everybody on the entire team together, uh, you'll commonly see, see collectives will go and they'll make sure that every player at least has the funds to offset the cost of attendance And the really good ones will obviously have a lot more. And so now, instead of having a, a, let's say a senior who has a COVID year, and his options are, I can take a $5,000 or $10,000 signing bonus to sign with this MLB team, or I can go back to college and play a COVID year. Now the calculus has changed because of NIL. And the calculus has changed to, I can take this $10,000 bonus offer from the MLB team, start my pro career, or I could go back to college because of my collective, it's probably going to be free to go back to college. I'm not having to actually pay to go to college now because of the collective. And I might make $10,000 in NIL money myself while I get a chance to finish my degree or get a graduate degree and improve the things that kept me from getting drafted where I thought I was going to get drafted. So the calculus has changed. And what I have not found out yet is how MLB teams are approaching this, knowing that you now have the option, or players now have the option of getting NIL money. How does that change the calculus? Because the the obvious thing to think about is, well, MLB teams will just pay players more. But... When have MLB teams voluntarily paid players more when they have not had to? When they've not been required to do it by a collective bargaining agreement or something like that. So market pressures may, in fact, 
drive up bonuses for guys who have eligibility left. I'll believe it when I see it, but we have to acknowledge that it's possible. And I think that's one of the bigger storylines of the draft to me is those juniors and then those seniors with the COVID year still. What happens with the average size of their bonus compared to what it was in previous years without a without a uh, without NIL? How does that change? In just a minute, I want to get to the other big unknown in this draft um, and how he's doing an independent ball. But first, today's episode is brought to you by our friends at Blue Nile. Whether you're ready to pop the question or you're celebrating a milestone moment, find jewelry as unique as her with the modern convenience of online shopping at BlueNile.com. Uh, if you want to build the engagement ring of her dreams, Blue Nile has simple online tools that let you choose the diamond shape, size, and clarity, as well as setting style. And then Blue Nile's bench jewelers will handcraft her perfect engagement ring. Each ring's one of a kind. If you just want to celebrate life special moments with fine jewelry, but you're having trouble choosing... Blue Nile has jewelry experts on hand. They're available via phone or chat to help you find a memorable gift at every single budget. So make your moment sparkle with jewelry from BlueNile.com. Locked on MLB listeners get $50 off a purchase of $500 or more. This podcast exclusive does include engagement rings. So use code Locked On. That's code Locked On. Plus, every order is insured, ships free, and arrives in discreet packaging that will not give away what's inside. So shop stress-free and find your forever peace. Go to BlueNile.com today. Today's episode is also brought to you by our friends at Rock Auto. There are so many makes and models of cars, and that's just increasing every year. And so it's impossible for your local chain auto parts store to stock all the parts you need. And so why put up with all of the um, intimidating pointless seeming questions like, hey, is this an LX or an EX? Is it a sport? Does it have this package or whatever? And wait while the person behind the counter goes back into the dark half of the building, looks through shelves and comes back and says, hey, we don't have the part. You have to, we have to order it for you. Um, you have a computer with access to rockauto.com in your pocket. So save time and money because Rock Auto is a family business that's been serving DIYers for over 20 years with reliably low prices for every single customer. You can explore the easy-to-use website to find the solution for your auto part needs. So go to rockauto.com right now and see all the parts available for your car or truck right locked on in the How Did You Hear About Us box so they know that we sent you. Amazing selection, reliably low prices, and all the parts your car will ever need at rockauto.com. Okay, so I mentioned NIL being one of the big questions of this draft to me. One of the other big questions of this draft to me is Kumar Rocker. Obviously, really high pick last year by the Mets. They saw something in the medicals that scared them. They refused to give him a signable offer at all. Um, He did not go back to Vanderbilt, which was expected that he would go back. He did not go back. Sat out the fall. um, Signed with the... Frontier League, it's an MLB partner league, um, and pitches for the Tri-City Valley Cats. So he's made four starts. Uh, In those four starts, 15 innings, nine hits, three earned runs. So ERA of 180. uh, Three walks, 25 strikeouts. Now of the three earned runs, he's given up two home runs. So I find that kind of interesting. But fastball sitting there. 95 to 97, sliders 83 to 84, cutters upper 80s, 87 or so. He's had some change-ups, which pretty decent arm speed. You know, he sold them with the solid arm speed, but the 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 velo difference wasn't that pronounced off the fastball. Fastball is 95 to 97, change-ups were at 89. So kind of wish the, the, the change-up had a little bit more different, like a little bit bigger of a difference there. But I ultimately don't necessarily think how he pitches in the Frontier League is going to be the deciding factor as to where Kumar Rocker goes. I think it's, is there going to be a team that is comfortable with the unknown of his medicals to take him? That's going to be the deciding factor. Because whatever the Mets saw in the medicals completely scared them. 
where they weren't even willing to give a signable offer to their 10th overall pick. That's why they have the 11th this year, and then they have their standard 14th. So, um, big question there. And I, I, he did not go to the, in, to the draft combine. And the Kumar Rocker rule that was instituted was, was um, negotiated by the Players Association and MLB during the CBA negotiations. The Kumar Rocker rule says if you attend the combine and you provide medicals and you are drafted in the top 10 rounds, the team that drafts you is required to give you an offer of at least 75% of slot value. Kumar Rocker did not attend the combine. So he is not eligible under the Kumar Rocker rule. So what could happen now is a team could take him in the first round. And when we did our mock, me and Jeff from Locked On Guardians, we had him in the first round because we don't necessarily know. He's the, he's the biggest single wild card in the draft. Uh, the question is which team is going to decide, okay, now's the point where we can take Kumar Rocker. His leverage is probably a little bit less than it was because he doesn't have college eligibility. And he's pitched 15 innings this spring. That's all he's pitched this spring. And so if he doesn't sign with the team, he's then going to have to either face the prospect of doing another season of independent ball, which, I mean, he's already 22. He'll be... So he'd be 23 next draft, having not played a full season of competitive ball in two years. So it feels like someone is going to take a gamble on him, I feel like in the first round, based off what he could be, with the understanding that if you don't sign him, one, you get the draft pick back next year, and then two... If you do sign him, you probably can get some sort of discount out of it because he doesn't really have a lot of leverage anymore. Um, Don't know if that's true, but that's just kind of what it feels like we're going to. Um, and, And kind of looking at another guy I wanted to update here that didn't pitch in the, uh, in college in the spring is Carson Wisenhunt. So East Carolina lefty and it was something where he was suspended for a banned substance Uh, there was belief it may have been some sort of steroids he said it was something else but either way he's now pitching in the Cape Cod League the Chatham Anglers Uh, he didn't pitch all spring got suspended by the NCAA and so um, he's a guy that I really if you watch it's obvious that he hasn't pitched, but at the same time, you can kind of see the promise there. So three games, 11 innings, 13 runs, ERA of 1064. And first two starts was seven innings, 771 ERA. So you can tell that, I mean, he gave, a, he, he gave up um, a home run early in that first start. Um, fastball kind of, he started off, he opened up at like fastballs, 93, 94, touching 95. He kind of settled in into 92, 93, looked a little rusty. Um, wasn't really commanding the fastball amazingly. Um, had difficulty hitting everything for, for strikes. I think he had about 55% of his pitches were strikes, but, um, the velocity, the spin rates, the movement on the, on the pitch were all in line with his historical averages. Um, the the br- brought out the changeup. The changeup had that that insane vertical drop to it. Looked ve- like looked better and better every time. Um, it's something where he's got a good frame. He's got a very clean delivery. It looks like it's easily repeatable, and so. The numbers on their face aren't amazing, the statistical numbers, especially the ERA over 10, but the, the, basic, the basic tools are there. The fastball is still there. The changeup 
is still there. He's rusty with his location, with his command and control, because he hadn't pitched all spring. But the basics are there. And so I think Carson Wisenhunt is probably going to, later in the first round, early in the second, maybe maybe in the, the competitive balance round in the middle, I still think that Carson Wisenhunt's going to be probably top five college pitchers off the board, partially because so many college pitchers are hurt, partially because the tools are still there. He just has to get back into game shape. So in just a minute, I want to get to some of the outstanding players from the College World Series uh, that are draft eligible. But first, today's episode is brought to you by our friends at BetOnline. BetOnline.net is your number one source for all your betting needs and sports info. You can get the latest sports developments, league reviews, and news. Um, hockey just finished up, so the Stanley Cup is over, but you can follow along with Major League Baseball. It's pretty much the only game in town right now. BetOnline is your continued source for all the sports wagering information, live betting, esports, and scores. And they're the best spot for your, for your scores and news this season. And... The ad copy actually reminds me, betonline.net. Uh, you can follow in the other sports that are still in season, including MMA, so fighting sports, boxing, and golf. Uh, so head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more about the trends in action because BetOnline is where the game starts. So Mississippi State, uh, uh, Old Miss, I'm sorry, Old Miss just won the College World Series. Two straight games over, um, over Oklahoma. And there's been a couple players that have really kind of stood out that deserve a little bit of of recognition in this for what they did during the tournament and how they raised their draft stock. So the first one, right-hand pitcher Dylan DeLucia of Old Miss. So transferred in from junior college, Northwest Florida State, into Old Miss. Um, started off in relief. And then after Mississippi, after Ole Miss lost their top three starting pitchers in their weekend rotation, he moved into the weekend rotation, and he's been um, he's been sitting 93, 94 on the fastball, a little bit of late life to it that's been good, and then the slider uh, got significantly better as the season went on, and he started. It's an interesting article about this. I actually read it in Sports Illustrated, uh, where he started varying. His, his finger position on the slider so that he can get different movement profiles with it off of a lefty versus a righty. Um, I feel like has a he, he's going to end up, these three pitches are all going to grade out to average. Um, and he's got average control. So a guy that is now going to be a fourth-year junior who turns 22 right after the draft. Uh, I feel like he probably took himself out of maybe late round contention, if not undrafted, after the run this spring, including two huge outings in um, at the College World Series in Omaha, where he had double digit strikeouts in both games, um, including incredibly deep runs. I think on the season he's got seven or eight starts of seven innings or more. I mean, he worked over a hundred pitches eight different times, nine different times. Uh, So I think now you're looking at a guy who is going to be considered organizational depth. Um, You know, possibly if he can harness some of these, if he can harness a slider a little better, maybe a number five starter. Um, But probably best case relief, middle relief. But he went out of probably not being drafted to getting himself drafted with the great run he had through the postseason and just showing, nope, he actually can do it um, as a starter. Hayden Dunhurst. Uh, catcher for Old Miss, premium defensive catcher. I got a chance to watch him in person when Old Miss came to Auburn uh, back in March, late March, early April. Uh, very, very good defensively. Um, really good at framing. Really good at at uh, throwing out base runners plus arm as well. But struggled a bit with like during the season. Offensively, hit 235, 379, 395, struck out 32% of the time. The big thing for him was he just got destroyed by velocity. And he wasn't the kind of guy that, like, he could hit fastballs, but you could get him if you threw a slider down on the way. I mean, he, you could just beat him with pure velocity. 
And so I think he's a guy, if he were to get drafted based off the defensive skills that he has, he could play for a surprisingly long time in the minors. But I think he won't get past double A if he can't hit velocity. So a guy that is probably going to enter the draft after his performance at the College World Series, but really probably needs to go back to Old Miss Go get the NIL money, go back to Old Miss, who just won the national championship, and look at re entering the draft next year if he can have a better offensive performance. Um, a guy that dramatically improved late in the season all the way through the through the College World Series, Peyton Graham, shortstop from Oklahoma. So opened through the end of March was batting 282, 351, 541, which is respectable, but you want to see both the batting average and on-base percentage a little bit higher if you're in college. Well, since then, he made some sort of different like swing adjustments and changes. Since then, so since the end of March, 370, 454, 721. Cut his strikeout rate down from 27% to 17%. Uh, so, plus runner, he's been to he's been to the Cape before. He played mostly shortstop and third at the Cape. Tried outfield a little bit. But I think that he's got enough talent to at least stay, or at least to start his career, his pro career at short. Um, still has swing and miss concerns. I mean, still had a 17% strikeout rate. Um, you can get him with a slider. But uh, I think the upside of being above average at short or probably a plus defender at third is enough to push him from somebody who was like, you need to go back to college for your senior year to late in the first, early in the second for Peyton Graham out of Oklahoma, the shortstop. Really good there. And then a guy who really kind of did well late in the season that you have to, you kind of have to acknowledge what he's done is Cade Horton, the righty out of Oklahoma. So sophomore, but he's going to be age eligible because he turns 21 right around time for the draft. Missed 2021 because of Tommy John. So abbreviated 2020, missed 2021. But he's got a fastball and a slider that are, are fantastic. So the fastball sits 95, 96. He can touch 98 with it. The slider is about 89. That and This is great. I saw a scouting report over the weekend as I was getting ready for, to watch the College World Series. And the scouting report said, the slider breaks downward so sharply that it doesn't just fall off the table. It takes the tablecloth and all the dishes with it. Which is objectively hilarious to describe a slider. But very good slider. So, I think the only thing that's stopping him from being like a surefire... I mean, because he's got two plus pitches, plus potentially better than that. I think the only thing that's stopping him from being a first rounder is he doesn't really have a third pitch. The changeup is just about nothing. And because of it, because he doesn't have that third pitch, he's so dependent on the fastball slider... Uh, lefties had an on-base percentage of almost 400 against him. And so, if you think that there's a third pitch in there somewhere, whether it's a curveball, if you can if you could give him a 12-6 to curveball so he has a weapon against lefties, if you can figure out a changeup, if you can do something there to get a third weapon, he's like a second rounder who profiles as a number four starter, maybe better if you can improve that third pitch. If not... He's one of those good college pitchers that we're probably going to move to relief because he's got those two plus pitches and he's going to be a third to fifth rounder. Uh, He does have leverage. Again, age eligible sophomore. He can go back for two more years uh, plus a COVID year, I think. I think he could pitch three more years if he wanted. So he's got plenty of leverage. So I expect there to be a team that takes him thinking they can develop a third pitch. And think about the teams that we talk about are good at developing pitchers. You think about the Rays. I think we have to put the Yankees in that category now. But 
Look for one of these teams to see the metrics on the fastball and the slider and say, hey, we can figure out a third pitch for this dude. So we're going to go get him and like we're going to we're going to get a deal on him. We're going to go get him, try to get a deal on him. Probably talk to him before the draft and work it out. And then we're going to give him a third pitch and make him a starter. Um, but a guy that pitched really well, I mean, this this lineup, this Ole Miss lineup lost maybe one or two games in the entire postseason, regional, super regionals, and Omaha. Uh, Cade Horton went seven and a third against them, four hits, two runs, uh, facing 27 batters. So, I mean, he did his job. He understood uh, what he had to do and did it well. The only reason they lost is because Oklahoma didn't score runs. It was four to two. Um, so, absolutely see somebody going after Cade Horton um, getting a pretty good pitcher if they can develop it. Uh, great week of shows coming up. Y'all stay tuned. If you have questions for the show, we do mailbags every Monday. I'm on Twitter at Crosby Baseball. The show's on Twitter at Locked On Farm, or you can email us, Locked On MLB Prospects at gmail.com. Also, drop them here in YouTube. Drop uh, If you're watching on YouTube, drop your questions in the comments below. We will get to them on next Monday's episode. Uh, but until then, this has been Locked On MLB Prospects. Uh-huh.